Well, thank you for uh, reassembling quickly, and uh, we will now hear uh, L.A. Paul, Lori Paul. I wanted to mention that uh, Billy Grassy reminded me uh, of what Garrison Keillor said, that uh, Einstein had proven what we had all suspected, that uh, time actually does slow down or distend when we're with our relatives. So I thought that was good. Okay, Lori Paul, thank you. Um, okay, so this is, you know, we're, we're addressing questions about the nature of time, and sometimes um, I'll talk about this as sort of constructing different models of the nature of time. Um, and constructing a model of the nature of time um, is partly a project, as Professor Barbara and Professor Albert have been um, demonstrating to us, um, a project involving the interpretation of the physics, drawing on the physics. But, it's, but I want to emphasize that it involves interpretation. So um, in this sense, it's partly a philosophical project, right? Um, we want to make sure that the empirical facts and the physics are covered in both of the alternative models of time that we're thinking about. But we need to draw on more than that. We need to make philosophical claims to get a kind of complete picture. And also because if each model is consistent with respect to the science, then the difference is going to be in the interpretation of the science. Now, what I want to say in a sort of little brief, uh, pretty much uh, off the cuff sort of comment is that I think developing a model of time is also partly a project, and this came up in Professor Barber's comments, a project that involves cognitive science and should involve cognitive science. And I'll amplify. Um, Excuse me, this, can you hear me? Is this working? Yeah. Um, We're working? not picking you up. I You're think not it's just, me up? I think it, it was facing away. Excuse me. <laughs> How about that? Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Much All right. I'm good at shots, so don't worry. Um, okay, so we're talking about a philosophical project that I think needs to draw on cognitive sciences. Okay? Um, not just straightforwardly, but interpret some of the empirical work that's been done in cognitive science about temporal experience. Now, why do you think we need to do this, Laurie? Well, look. In addition to having a model of, of time that draws on the physics, we need to have an account that relates our experience of time, our temporal phenomenology, okay, to time itself. Now there are issues, and I'll um, say a little more about just how, how I think this should go. There are a lot of issues I'm going to gloss as I comment briefly. Um, in particular, there are subtle issues involving um, the, uh, whether or not you know how perceivers in time can also um, understand and interpret scientific observations. Lots of things are. That was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of there are subtle issues about you know how perceivers in time can actually interpret the science that I'm not even going to deal with. I'm going to make a much simpler methodological claim. Right. What I want to focus on is just how we're supposed to understand and draw on ordinary experience and ordinary phenomenology when we construct these philosophical models. Because the fact of the matter is, when we're choosing between two different models of the nature of time, both of which are consistent with the physics, what matters then, partly, is um, how we can fit these models with what we think we know by experience uh, living in a temporal universe. And it turns out there's quite a bit of work in Cogside that's relevant to ordinary experience, and again, um, Julian Barber mentioned this, because there's a lot of work on a whole range of issues that basically demonstrates that our world, our, um, our perceptual experience of the world is incredibly constructed. Now, don't understand this the wrong way. I'm not making a Kantian point or an idealist point. No, I'm simple, okay? I'm a very simple person. Um, don't believe, you know, my husband would not confirm that, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a simple person, straightforward. I like realist pictures of the world. So a summary kind of scientifically realist perspective where we really do learn about the external world and learn about truth from the external world through science, still, still we're going to say that perceptual experience is highly constructed. And in fact, a lot of empirical work in psychology tells us about how perceptual experience is highly constructed. Before I sort of try to explain this, and, um, I'm going to make a couple of metaphysical distinctions. That's what, meta what, what philosophers do. There are instances of time 
Um, and maybe the ordering, ordering relations between them. That's one sort of possible temporal feature of reality. Maybe the times are events or shapes or configurations of the universe. Maybe there's only one kind of um, configuration of the universe. So just, these are issues about um, what we might call, what we've called um, instance of time. So it can be introduced, as, I, as you were suggesting, I think, to configurations. Um, then there's the direction of time, which philosophers sometimes talk about as the temporal arrow. And which, among other things, gives us a difference between the past and the future. Um, and um, in particular, making the past fixed while the future is not. And Professor Albert was talking about uh, material relating to this issue. This difference between the past and the future gives us an asymmetry of influence. We can influence events in the future, but we can't influence events in the past. Then finally, there are questions about the passage of time. That's a little different from the instance of time. Okay, it involves the instance. Um, and what people mean when they talk about the passage is roughly something like the way that time seems to change or flow, such that events in the future become present and then pass into the past. It's what keeps time from being static. So let me talk about um, Professor Barber's stuff uh, first. He talked about change in motion, whether change is an illusion which is connected to the passage of well of time. So I'm gonna focus on the metaphysical status of some of these comments. All right, although note um, that change it's not supposed to be the same thing as passage, right? Rather, it's supposed to be one of our ways of detecting that, that time has actually passed, because we detect change, possible indicator. Now, you might reject the idea that the universe is static and think the passage of time must simply be a primitive feature of time. And there's a long-standing debate in metaphysics and in philosophy of science about whether temporal passage as a primitive feature of time really exists or whether it's just a temporal illusion. Now, a way to kind of um, just think about these debates is in terms of reductionism versus anti-reductionism. I wrote up here, but I mean by reductionism is not what you meant, and I'm not, I'm not sure I, I understand it, so I'm gonna use my own terms. Um, roughly, the thought is that you can have these disputes about a temporal feature, like passage or direction or the future or whatever, and you can dispute about whether or not one should be a reductionist about this temporal feature or an anti-reductionist. The reductionist says, look, either that feature exists, but it's reducible to some other feature of time, all right? Or says, no, no, that, that feature just doesn't exist at all. It's, not, um, it's just an illusion, okay? The anti-reductionist says, no, 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 there is that feature, and usually says um, that it somehow is primitive, or at least it's not reducible to anything else. Now, the dispute in metaphysics about passage or change, or the underlying sort of subtrend for, for change, right? <laughs> Um, is a dispute about whether or not passage involves temporal illusion, whether or not it actually exists. And you might think that the anti-reductionist about temporal passage has the upper hand, and quite obviously, because the reductionist is arguing in a sense that time is static. And that seems bizarre. How can you make sense of ordinary experience, about the way we seem to experience change and flow in the universe, if you think time is static? And that means that there's a kind of explanatory problem for the reductionist. And if we thought um, along with Priya that you know, a, good ex a, a good account needs explanation, then the reductionist has a kind of explanatory burden that she has to discharge. And here's where we can look at some of the empirical work done in cognitive science. Right? Because um, reductionists, I think, can help themselves to interesting work involving um, motion illusions or apparent motion. And this is the very same illusion that you get when you watch a film or you look at an old-fashioned flip book. In other words, it's well known that if you, get a, if you view a series of static images, we were just talking about passage now, right? A series of static images that as long as they're spaced in the right way, we will impose a sense of motion, animation, or change on that in set of images. Everybody has experienced this every time you go to a you're seeing a series of static images, but it looks as though you're seeing all kinds of changes. Right. So now, this illusion of temporal passage, or right, talking about this illusion, is something that the reductionist can then help herself to, to try to explain how the universe could be static after all, how her view still makes sense. I also want to mention, um, you talked about like why we see motion, and considered about what, you know, whether motion should be thought of as a secondary quality. This is also another place where I think we can draw on some cognitive science. Not, I think, quite in the way that Eagleman wants to. I, I'm a little worried about some of the things he wants to say, but, but I think the work is interesting. Here, all, what, all I want to do is to point to an important distinction between the sensation of motion, one might say, or our experiencing motion, and motion itself, whatever that physical fact in the world might be. 
um, the work on um, motion illusions shows us that it's very easy for us to perceptually sort of respond and have an experience of something that seems to flow or change. And it may be, once we make this distinction about mo um, seeing or experiencing the sensation of motion versus motion itself, that your arguments about the secondary qualities change. Because we might want to say our experience of motion is a secondary quality, but leave motion understood in some sense, maybe consistent with what we want to say, actually out there in the universe. OK. Now, similar issues come up when we discuss the metaphysics of a temporal arrow. And now I'm going to turn to um, Professor Albert's work. The metaphysics responsible for the temporal asymmetries involving the past and the future. Okay. And these involve um, the asymmetry of our influence or control over the future. Uh, we can control some of the future through causation, but not the past. And also the kind of phenomenally sharp feel of the difference between the fixed past and the unfixed future. Back to our reductionist, anti-reductionist split. The reductionist right, um, argues that the temporal asymmetries reduce to other asymmetries, while, in other words, asymmetries of entropy things, while the non-reductionists argue that we need a primitive temporal arrow to account for these asymmetries, shall we say, of um, production or control. Now, I'm sympathetic to the reductionist view, okay? Um, sympathetic, though, in a resistant way, because I feel the pull of the anti-reductionist perspective. I feel the pull of um, the need for an explanation to understand ordinary experience. I mean, I'm just a metaphysician who likes to walk through mud. So, you know, I have to be happy with the phenomenology to really kind of you know, buy into um, a reductive physical picture. It's all about how it feels. Okay. Um, <coughs> the anti-reductionist um, might argue that, look, we've got to have this temporal arrow to capture our ordinary experience. Right? We need an account of why we have this ordinary experience of the world as fundamentally temporally asymmetric, why it seems to be productive in the future direction or why there seems to be this phenomenal kind of um, distinction between the past and the future. Because you know, we can literally feel ourselves producing things in the future right? when we perform certain kinds of actions. So the anti-reductionists might say, look, the only um, way, or at least they can, I think they will say that I have a very nice way of explaining the way the world seems, is to have this primitive temporal arrow. But they might make a stronger claim. They might say, look, and I'm the only one who's giving a good explanation here. So, the, anti, the reductionist thing, someone like David Albert, I think needs a response to the anti-reductionist. Okay? How is she going to explain the phenomenological feel of the difference between the past and the future? And here again, we should look to the cognitive science because cognitive science shows us how constructive experience is. Well, what can we look at? Well, there are interestingly well-documented effects involving our sense of the anticipation of the future, related a little bit to what Eagleman was saying. Again, here though, I think the, one of the, um, these are called backwards masking effects. And one that I'm quite interested in, which was apparently first noticed by Husserl, um, involves when you listen to a melody for the first time, so it's not a familiar piece of music, right? It turns out that when you hear a note at a time, that your qualitative experience of that note is actually affected by the note that's about to follow it. Wow. So in this weird kind of funky way, in a sense, we can see into the future. Our experience at the present is affected by facts that, are, um, that, um, that occur after the um, event that's causing our experience in the present. Now, um, my thought is there that maybe there's a foothold for someone who wants to say, look, this kind of phenomenal anticipatory moon of events that are about to occur has something <coughs> to do with our feel um, of the sort of temporal, uh, the, the, uh, the temporal asymmetry of the world. These are just kind of suggestive remarks at this stage. Okay? But let me also mention a ton of experimental work that exists on causal impressions. And this work started with um, the Belgian psychologist in Scott in the 40s. It's a huge amount of really interesting work on how impressions of production and causation are generated in agents. And also, by the way, a lot of interesting work on, devel on the development of causal concepts and causal experience. So here again, um, with reference to uh, David Albert's point about how there's a sharp phenomenal difference between the past and the future, and also I want to know how there's a difference in the way we feel agents like we can affect the future, right? We should look at the empirical work on the way these causal impressions are generated. Because it turns out that it's really easy to, to generate causal impressions even when you know there's no causation involved. So in other words, as long as you see what looks like a billiard ball moving along 
and then it seems to hit another billiard ball. You'll get, if it's done the right way, a strong and pervasive sense of a causal impression, even if you know there's no causation involved. So there's a kind of perceptual raw response, um, a kind of causal production that the shot first noted and has been extensively de demonstrated and documented. So why care about this? Well, as I said, this, I think these, um, these results from the psychology give us or give the reductionist the tools to claim that perhaps the phenomenal feel of the sense we have of the future unfolding or being productive in some sense in some fundamental way is built into the very way that we experience. Okay? So the phenomenology or the temporal phenomenology that we experience or some of these features are products in a way of how we sense or experience the world. And this is not, as, as I said, a Kantian or an idealist point. It's straightforwardly realist. We're just preserving the distinction between mind and world. And in fact, just drawing on empirical work in psychology as much as we're drawing on empirical work in physics. And so I want to, in a sense, encourage, there aren't really any psychologists here. And I think that would be, uh, they'd, be a they'd be useful contributors to this discussion. Let me also just back this up by saying there's also lots of work on perceptions of control and goal-directed behavior involving inanimate objects. And Brian Scholl, who's a psychologist here at Yale, is one of the most well-known and important contributors to this discussion. He's done a lot of great work on temporal and causal sort of impressions, um, as well as impressions of control and goal-directedness. Okay. So let me just kind of um, uh, recap then. Okay, The anti-reductionist says, look, we need to explain our senses of these temporal features, of these temporal asymmetries in the world, of temporal passage that we detect. And then, you know, um, charges the reductionist, right, with a kind of explanatory burden. And this is what's known in philosophy as a kind of explanatory gap argument. Um, the anti-reductionist kind of thing can rightly say at this stage that the reductionist account of the world is leaving an explanatory gap. The gap between um, the picture as given by the reductionist and our experience of the world, right? So the reductionist then, the anti-reductionist, of course, can fill that gap by postulating these term primitive temporal features. So she's filled the gap. The reductionist needs to fill that gap as well. And the suggestion is, because the reductionist, of course, isn't going to buy into the primitive temporal features, that the reductionist look to cognitive science, right? Um, because cognitive science has done a lot of work, especially on um, experience of time, to see whether we can make sense of the idea that certain kinds of perceptual mechanisms are responsible for these impressions of production, evolution, and if that does work, then we get a little bit of a different picture of the dialectic. So the question here is, right, when we're looking at two different models of the nature of time, which model overall gives us the best explanation? Now, the problem for the reductionist is that Occam derangeur could cut too deep, right? So deep that you, you know, I don't want to like the word work too much, it bleeds. You bleed, you bleed <laughs> all, all, away all our experience. You don't have any connections to the way we normally live our lives. So there's a problem, right? So the reductionist needs to try to argue, look, I can give the overall best explanation, but it's not enough just to say I have the simplest explanation. I also have an explanation that gives an explanation, sorry, and a model to an explanation of our experience. The anti-reductionist has no, is not using Occam's razor as severely, right? But um, by doing that, is it able to preserve an account between the nature of the world and our experience? And so what we need, as I said, is to bring cognitive science into the debate so that we can have a better picture of how to weigh the two models and look at which one overall gives us the best explanation. Can I use this? Is that it? And now, Jill North. Okay, thanks. Don't feel rushed. Okay, well, I was gonna set a timer, but okay. Timer. Um, Okay, thanks. Uh, so I should preface my comments by saying I don't have any very detailed um, comments prepared since I wasn't sure exactly what um, David and Julian, if it's okay if I call you first names, um, were going to say. Uh, but I just want to make a couple of quick remarks, um, two quick remarks in an attempt to further generate some discussion. Um, so first what I want to do is just uh, make a remark on David's talk, in particular tying it into the overriding question that's guiding this conference. Um, and the second thing I want to do is ask a question uh, for Julian about his view, a possibly annoying philosopher's question, but I'm going to uh, ask it anyway. Um, so David's talk, uh, though it focused 
primarily on one aspect of it, um, he did allude to a wider project in the background, which is to explain all pervasive temporal asymmetries on the basis of one simple unified account. Um, one simple unified theory. In fact, the very theory, David urges, that were led to in, um, in the face of the reversibility objections to classical statistical mechanics. Uh, that worry, remember, is if we start out with the current macrostate of a system, uniform distribution over it, plug it into the dynamical laws, we'll get the wrong predictions, wrong entropic predictions about the past of this system. Okay, so the solution, David urges, is to move that probability distribution back to the initial low entropy macrostate of the universe, the past hypothesis. Um, the fundamental laws of this theory, of the resulting theory of statistical mechanics, are the dynamical laws, whether it's F equals MA, Schrodinger's equation, what have you. Uh, the past hypothesis, this idea that the universe came into existence in a very low entropy state, the kind of thing that we get from Big Bang cosmology. And the statistical postulate, this uniform probability distribution taken over the initial microstates compatible with that initial low entropy macrostate. Okay. So uh, first thing I want you to notice is the theories. Um, so someone in another session used this word. Uh, it's utter hubris. So uh, taking the probabilities of this theory seriously, um, this theory of statistical mechanics has become a universal, fundamental, probabilistic theory of the world. Um, because the probability distribution that's taken over the initial microstates compatible with the past hypothesis, combined with the dynamics, will yield a probabilistic prediction, a prob an exact probability assigned to every event in the history of the universe, every physical event. So this probability distribution dragged along with the dynamics, will assign a probability to every possible fundamental microstate of the universe at any time, and therefore also will assign a probability to all physical states that supervene on those fundamental microscopic physical states. Um, so if you want to know whether the theory, if you want to know what the theory predicts, say, for the probability that there will be a fire drill during this session, like there was at 2 a.m. at the Omni last night, um, what you do is you take the initial probability distribution and you conditionalize on the macro state which, in which there is a fire drill in this room during this session, and you get your probability. And a similar procedure yields a probability for any event or proposition that corresponds to a suitably well-defined region in the universe's phase space. Um, so back to the theme of this conference. Um, David's theory of statistical mechanics suggests a general model of um, fundamental physical explanation. As he says, he said something, uh, I didn't, don't get the quote exactly right, but he said something along the lines of, to explain a mechanical phenomenon of nature is to show how it can be extracted, in principle at least, by conditionalization from this master probability distribution. Okay, so now we see the problem as far as our question guiding the conference is concerned. Um, this theory, perhaps the most ambitious universal theory we could imagine, um, doesn't seem able to answer the question of why there is something rather than nothing, why there is anything. Um, the theory's probabilities are taken over, they're conditionalized on the initial macrostate of the universe, this initial low entropy macrostate. This theory, in other words, assigns a probability one to that initial low entropy macrostate. Um, and in that macrostate, there is something. Uh, this theory does consider it assigns probabilities to different, micros different possible microscopic realizations of that initial macrostate, but it doesn't consider different possible initial macrostates, in particular ones in which, in some sense, there is nothing. So, um, and that would seem to be the kind of thing one would want in order to answer this question of why there is something, some kind of prob probability assigned to universes in which there's something versus universes in which there is not. And this theory just doesn't consider that. Um, now, I, I should, maybe there are further probabilities coming from a larger theory, um, a multiverse, something like that that could help. I'll just leave that for discussion, maybe for this afternoon's discussion. Um, but in short, uh, 
the main point I want to make is just that even Albert's incredibly ambitious universal theory seems to leave us with maybe a kind of skepticism on the prospects of at least a fundamental physical explanation for why there is anything, why there is something, because it assumes that there is something. It assigns that claim probability one. Okay. Um, for Barber, um, Julian, uh, so you say things, what I want to ask is, which of the following is your view? Um, you say things like uh, talking about eliminating time entirely from physics. Time does not exist. Although you also talk about things like emergent di uh, duration, emergent space time. And what I'm wondering, uh, again, I'm wearing my philosopher hat, what I'm wondering is whether your view is the more radical one that time does not exist. There is no temporal structure whatsoever, or the slightly, somewhat less radical view that time or temporal structure isn't fundamental. Um, spelling that out a little bit more, just the latter view to, strikes me as less radical and that at least allows us to make some sense of claims um, that utilize temporal structure. Some things like uh, some temporal intervals are longer than others. These claims, it seems like, aren't completely wrong or confused as they would be on the view that time has no structure at all. Rather, these claims are just, they're not fundamental. The non-temporal facts determine the temporal facts. Um, fundamentally, at bottom, the world has no temporal structure, but it emerges in some sense. So in short, is the view that there is no temporal structure, full stop, claims about temporal structure are, are false, um, or is it that there's no fundamental temporal structure, but it somehow emerges from the non-temporal stuff underneath it all? And then a final question or a final thought, either way, whichever view that is uh, you have in mind, and you might not care about that distinction. Uh, I, fair enough. <laughs> um, uh, whichever view you have in mind, um, I was wondering whether you're motivated by a kind of um, sort of structural Occamist argument in favor of this view on the grounds that, look, this theory can explain the phenomena while doing without what, in your view, is excess fundamental structure, namely temporal structure, um, in the same way that plausibly we can do, do away with an absolute velocity space-time structure in classical Newtonian mechanics, for instance. Is that kind of inference in the background, which is an inference I'm very happy with, so that's what I was wondering. Okay, that's it. So we have plenty of time for, uh, for commentary. Um, I thought maybe I would uh, kick it off because of the fact that uh, the representation of religion in this session is a little deficient. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention two references and see if you had any thoughts about them. The first is uh, in Exodus where, uh, <clears throat> where Moses is uh, encountering God very, very, very closely. And he's trying to sort of get a handle on God. He asks God's name, and God says, I am, I am. Uh, in other words, I'm in the present moment. Then he asks to see God's face. <clears throat> and God replies that a mortal cannot do that. Uh, but what, um, what, he can, what God can do, he or she, is pass by, and Moses can see that passage. And um, that um, reflects the fact that um, God's locus is in the absolute present instant. That's, that's the kingdom of heaven. The, the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. Muhammad says, uh, uh, God is closer, you, closer to you than the veins in your neck. But we can't perceive that present moment. As we know from science, um, we have to process the sensations coming in at the present moment. And by the time we're done doing that, the present moment is past. And so, in a sense, there's a gap between us and the kingdom of heaven uh, in that we don't actually live, we don't actually experience in the present moment as it happens. So I th that was, that was uh, one reference. The other reference um, is that uh, 
many religious traditions have a, a period or a state prior to this state. And uh, the one I think that's uh, most clearly articulated is in um, the Theogony of Hesiod, the, the Greco-Roman version. And in that version, um, there is a period called the, the period of the Titans. And the, that period is a, uh, a period that involves titanic elemental forces interacting in ways that are not like our order. They are prior to this order. In some ways, they're more primal, more fundamental, but they're, they're not analogous. And so um, when this order bursts forth from that order in, in a, a process very reminiscent of, of the inflation period of the Big Bang, where the new order just flows into non-space, when that happens, um, the previous order is shut off and made inaccessible. It becomes dark, okay? It becomes uh, double dark. But the forces are still there. The forces are still active. And what, what happens to those forces is they are used to become the framework of this order, okay? Um, you have um, one force which is pushing outward, Kylo. Uh, you have another force bringing inward, um, represented by Atlas, and so on. These titanic forces then uh, remind me of what Joel and, and Nancy spoke about at the Terry Lectures, where uh, dark energy and dark matter are in a realm that's equally inaccessible to us, Tartarus. And that, uh, however, they play some sort of a fundamental role in the structure of this universe. Uh, they form um, a lattice in which the uh, galaxies collect in the interstices. Uh, and so if, if that analogy is of interest, uh, it would predict that uh, there is a, a state uh, prior to this universe, uh, more fundamental. Uh, and I think the, the way of conceiving that space or that, that state is to conceive of time as you experience it uh, as you're going to sleep or waking up. W when your, your physical senses are shut down, but you're still able to experience. And that kind of time, which is completely different from this kind of time, uh, could be an analogy to that. It doesn't explain why is there anything, but it does say that there is uh, predict predicts a prior point out of which this order comes. So there's a little bit of religion for you. Um, who would like to start? Yes, David. Um, I, can, I can just, um, um, first of all, I wanted to thank Lori and Jill for, for the, their remarks, and, and I thought they were really interesting. Um, um, I think I, I just agree with everything that Jill said um, um, about um, the, the project that I was describing. I had one thing to say about Lori's comment, and that's um, at particular on, particularly on this question of how much we should expect cognitive science to um, be illuminating about these matters. One, you know, there's something, no question, the phenomenology of the passage of time is, you know, some, something that goes on in our head. Um, but I think in contrast with other kinds of phenomenology, in contrast with how things taste or how things look or something like that, we would be flabbergasted, I think, to encounter Martians um, whose epistemic and causal relations to the past and future are the inverse of ours. We wouldn't be flabbergasted to encounter Martians to whom things that taste delicious to us taste repulsive to them. We wouldn't be flabbergasted to encounter Martians who were in all sorts of phenomenological ways very different from us. I think we would be flabbergasted to encounter Martians whose relation to the past and future 
in these epistemic and causal senses is, say, the inverse of our own. And that seems like a hint that the place to look for a naturalistic account of these differences, if that's the business one is in, is um, in a deeper and more general place than the details of human psychology. Um, that's, that's the kind of thing that encourages the impression that where you're likely to find this, where you ought to expect to find this, is in quite fundamental, quite simply statable, universal physical claims about, about the way the world is. So I don't disagree with that. Um, the suggestion is, so look, at, one looks to the physics and maybe finds a, a, a physical basis for these asymmetries. And, um, and it may be that the impressions that we have associated with production or whatever are veridical in some sense. Right. It's not a surprise. Right. I mean, our success as agents probably depends on that. Right. It's, I think, rather just important to know that um, the source of those impressions may not be directly from, okay, um, recognition of the sort of deep physical structure of the world. Maybe indirectly, and there's some feedback. Right. But there's another. There are other sources, that's and fair and the thought is that we need to take that into account when we're giving our overall model. That seems right, and that seems okay. fair enough. But just, and so it sounds like you agree with this. It's quite a different case from the way we would expect psychology and neurophysiology to contribute to our understanding of what sorts of foods we like. Absolutely. Um, um, mm -hmm. Or something like that. What I'm proposing, I don't think it's been, I, I, it's a, actually a methodological proposal I think has not been exploited mm -hmm. yet in, in various ways, so yeah. I wanted to make one correction, Laurie, which is that uh, we do have a psychologist with us, and not only a psychologist, but a rather distinguished uh, um, quantum psychopathologist. So, and that's uh, Donald Bender in the back there. So he's. Try not to wear that thing on my name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's quite well known in that field, and in cognitive science. Um, yes. Um, just general response to Laurie on on, on the cognitive things. Um, I mean, clearly, I've I've put forward a very, very strong conjecture that there really is no role for time at all. And for a long time, I make concessions to <laughs> our experience. I have felt there was no hope of real support from either theoretical calculations or experimental work in, in, uh, in support of my ideas. I, I come to think that perhaps now brain neuro science might give support. And this is partly from my interaction with, with David Eagleman. I don't know, first of all, I was I only came aware of his work because we both appeared in a film Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. I don't know if anybody <laughs> saw it, but, but I was presented as the outrageous person saying time doesn't exist. And he was m a bit cast the way they did it as, as providing at least some evidence to support it. And we were together in this foundational questions uh, conference uh, very recently in uh, Norway and, and Denmark. And I had quite a lot of discussion with him. And he, he thought my suggestion that it was that motion was actually created by consciousness was not totally uh, outrageous. I mean, I don't want to put words into his mouth. So um, I, I do think it's, it's, it's not impossible. Now, this point, actually, that you were making, though, James, is related to that. Um, of course, in standard conventional terms, we don't experience now when it happens. It's, it's it because of the time the brain takes to process things. But our experience of something is a now. For me, actually, this is, again, Leibniz with his plurality within a unity. I experience life as a sort of continuous stream of snapshots. And I have that very strong impression that there is a snapshot at, at a moment. And what happens in that moment is, is very magical. Uh, I've, I've mentioned uh, Janet Baker in my book, The End of Time, where I heard her interviewed. And she was asked if when she was singing in an opera and one particular bit went absolutely magically well, whether she would attempt to repeat that the next night. And she said, absolutely not. 
this is the quickest way to destroy the magic of the now, the unpredictability of what's going to happen. Um, and I think I've talked to musicians about this. All the training they do, the string quartet players, to counting like mad to do everything is actually then to leave them flexibility to do things somehow or other. That comes from within. That's the conduit. All, all poets and, and, and people say they're just a conduit for, for things that come through them. This, this is the magic of the now that, that, that comes out. Um, Talking about God passing, I can't omit to say a lovely story of my friend Carol Kukash, whose daughter was in the um, one of the national parks in Utah, southern Utah, and, and a frog jumped, and he asked, she was two years old, did you, did you see the frog? No, but I saw the jump. Uh. <laughs> um, so, that, uh, so anyway, I t totally agree. I think there is a lot to, I got very interested now in, in cognitive science. Um, as to Jill's comments, um, I really am radically uh, sticking my neck out and saying that time has absolutely no part in it. Uh, I needed much longer than, than the time I, I took to do it. I should clarify there's a big difference in when I'm talking about this between an account of classical physics where there is a notion of a unique history of the universe, in which case that was when I was talking about the notion of duration, which is emerging within classical Newtonian physics. Um, and uh, it's quite different uh, if you go into the quantum domain and take the wheeler dewitt equation seriously. And then I have to rely on this notion of a time capsule to give me a notion of, of time. And I think the geologist's discovery of deep time, which was, of course, a a huge um, discovery, and it, it was one of these things uh, Don was making this point about existential angst. I mean, much more really than Darwin, it was the discovery of the geologists that, that started the existential angst, their discovery of deep time. And that was literally done from unchanging things. It was just reading, reading the record in the rocks and the fossils. Um, so um, th that has to be very different. Uh, those two ways. I want to just mention that uh, evolution has struggled uh, greatly to minimize that time by putting our eyes and our heads and our ears in our heads to minimize the distance that those senses have to go to, to, to decrease that processing time, which of course is uh, what survival can be all about. Mm. Um, but that gap still is there. And uh, that gap uh, is where the moral ground is. That, that's where moral decisions get made in that little, little mm. slice. Anyone else uh, should I open it up? Michael? Uh, I, um, uh, I really appreciate all, all the talks. I want to engage with Jill and Julian a bit uh, because I thought that Jill raised a, a good way of formulating a question, is, does Julian is he committed to the elimination of time, or just sees time as not fundamental? And I think if you draw the Leibnizian connection, and as I mentioned before to you, that um, Leibniz sees time as a well-founded phenomenon, but it's, so it's founded in something else, right? So it's not fundamental. So it has some role to play, but it's, it's sort of illusory, too. So it's in between ground. So I'm not sure that uh, you need to say that time doesn't exist at all. It's just not playing any fundamental explanatory role in the system. And that, that point, I think, was helped. It was clarified for me by Jill's comments. Um, but taking the Leibnizian analogy leads me to two questions for, for you, Julian. Uh, one is how far would you take this uh, Leibnizian picture? Because Leibniz also, for similar reasons that he uh, saw time as merely phenomenon, phenomenal, it was a well-founded phenomenon, he also wanted to see space as not a fundamental feature of the world, and also causation between distinct things as not a fundamental feature of the world. So I wondered whether you'd be uh, willing to go that far with Leibniz and seeing uh, space as phenomenal in some sense, and causation between distinct things as phenomenal. And my second question, uh, let me just get another question out, then you can answer none of them if you want. Uh, my, my second question is, is related uh, about how, how, how far will you go? Because I'm very excited by views that when you stick your neck out like this. I think that's, that's great. Um, the, the, the second question concerns the question of this conference. And, and you, uh, unlike David, you're not answering the question of this conference. And that's great. Uh, it's just, that's something that Jill pointed out. Uh, uh, I thought that was right, too, but, that, but you were doing something else. Uh, you, you, you gestured, uh, Julian, how your uh, views on, on time 
uh, help, might help give an answer to the question of this conference, right? And, uh, and it's, it was kind of neat. It was, it was neat because uh, you said, look, the, the, the why question arises because it seems that there's a distinction between the laws and the condition and condi contingent initial conditions. Once you get time out of the picture in some sense, or make it non-fundamental, then the con contingent initial conditions are not fundamental. But one might think that if you get time out of the picture, it's, it's the initiality that's gone, right? Nothing's, nothing's first. There's no time in that way. But there could still be contingency, contingent conditions. And the why question might arise because if there are contingent conditions, forget about whether they're initial or not. If we eliminate time or get rid of time, the, the initialness is not, no longer a factor. If there's contingency still in your picture, then there might be a legitimate why question that's still a asked. But then I wondered, are you also going to go uh, make a similar move here and say, well, no, the contingency also is merely illusory or merely phenomenal. And so, and if that were the case, that's where you're going, then I can see how uh, your approach might help address the question about why, why is there anything at all. So, um, so, the, so to sum up, uh, uh, will you want to go to say go with Leibniz to say that um, spatiality and causation between these same things are illusory or phenomenal in some sense? And similarly, to, in order to answer the why question, would you would you go to say that contingency is also illusory? Um, I'd go a long way with Leibniz. Uh, well, I, I, but by the way, I should say that Leibniz does not want to go all the way and say that contingency is illusory. He he, he doesn't want to go that far himself, but. I wondered whether you would. Um, at the moment, certainly, there's a lot of contingency. I mean, the, the, the choice of what the possible configurations of the universe are, that, that's hugely contingent at the moment. I mean, short of having a final theory of everything, we, we don't have the answer to that. By the way, let me just mention, I, I read somewhere, Gödel apparently believed there was no contingency at all in the physical world, that everything was determined. He said, it is in mathematics I want it to be in the real world. Um, maybe that is. I've, I've no idea. I mean, that, that's, that really is uh, a very wild speculation, I would say. Um, I think that spatial relationships, this these, uh, when I wrote down these, these, these algebraic relationships which hold between distances, that I think is very, very fundamental. I don't think one can begin to do anything in science without something like that. Um, but this is also related to Jill's question. I'm very much an Occamist in trying to get that down to the absolute minimum that you have to do. At the moment, if things work out with my project with my collaborators, we are actually able to take distance out of the foundations of physics and just retain angles, only angles. And uh, there, is a, there is a representation of general relativity which we have, which is closely related to this work that Jimmy York did uh, 40 years ago, which is now the basis of, of numerical relativity. Um, which, uh, which goes in that direction. So this is very radical, but there are issues like where do quantities come in, numbers come in. Now, I think angles are actually the bedrock of, of, of physics and science. You have, if, you, if you get angles out, uh, if you throw them out as well, I just don't <laughs> see how you're going to get off. And again, to quote Shakespeare, this time King Lear, uh, Lear to Cordelia, nothing will come of nothing, speak again. <laughs> um, so I think that's about all my answers to your questions, was it? And a bit to, to Jill's one as well. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. So um, to pick up uh, a point that Michael, this is a question for Julian, a point that, that Michael made in the opening talk, um, uh, that, that there may be something to, to, something to say about what it is to exist. Um, so. For, for Leibniz, there's this um, there's Platonia. Um, and Sorry, Le Le Leibniz has a has a has a Platonia. I mean, a Platonia, yes. Call it that, of course. Um, yeah. But uh, um, the plurality of possible worlds, and some of them are have, have richer variety than others. And um, then he God singles out the one that has the greatest variety and the greatest unity, and and creates that one. Um, so that frees Leibniz from having to say um, much about what it is to exist, um, because there's this action of a of a of, in, of, of a will um, to to move 
a possible that has certain features um, into, into actuality. So on your picture, um, there's, there's a path through Platonia um, that's singled out as, um, as unique, you know, having the greatest variety and the greatest unity, um, you know, starting at alpha. Uh, but is it any part of your theory to say something about what it is for that path um, to be the actual path um, of, of the universe? Is, is it just that there's a law which singles out that path and says that it's the actual one? Um, or, is, or, is, or is it for that path to be actual just for it to be unique in that way? Uh, no, I, I went through that very quickly, I'm afraid. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't talking about a path being realized. I think that there are I think there are many paths through Platania which have higher probabilities if we take the mathematics seriously. Now, this is a huge extrapolation of quantum mechanics as we know it. It may well break down. Roger Penrose is, is working hard to try and show quantum mechanics doesn't apply to anything bigger than a grain of sand and things like that. Um, but so that, that was sort of slightly misleading. What, I, what I'm saying, and this is very naive, it's very straightforward, it's the simplest, inter it, in fact it's called the naive Schrodinger interpretation, which is the one I advocate, is that the, the mathematics will give you different probabilities for the individual configurations, not paths. That's when the appearance of, 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 of a classical history emerges. But, but there, will be, there will be configurations of the universe, and this, this is definitely in the mathematics, there's no question. I mean, as I, I just mentioned, you can pick up the Midsummer Night's Dream, and it's all there in black on white, the whole story, <laughs> and you can check back that what Hippolyta said was right, it did happen, you know, and they, it, uh, it, it's all there. Um, but quantum mechanics is, has this extraordinary thing that one talks about probability being absolute in quantum mechanics as opposed to ignorance. Um, if I toss a coin and don't look where it's landed, I don't know whether it's heads or tails, but it, quantum mechanics seems to suggest that probability is something much more fundamental. And this leaves this, it, it, it isn't one unique universe that is selected in this particular, or even one unique configuration. There's a whole range of possibilities there. This is what quantum mechanics seems to suggest. Now, m maybe this is a more appealing view of the world. I don't know. Um, I don't know, and then maybe this is completely too simple-minded and so forth, but, but what, what I do feel is, is, as I've said it, I think it's absolutely clear, I think we might really find it fruitful for science to really seriously take the idea that time does not exist and see what we can do with that conjecture, entertain that conjecture. Joel. Um, I wanted to raise uh, a series of questions for Julian, uh, some of them technical and some of them sort of obvious. Uh, so let me just state a series of questions and uh, then you can respond to them one by one if you like. The first one has to do with uh, what I take to be your elimination of time by the use of the Lagrangian formalism. However, as you must well know, uh, in the Lagrangian formalism, the initial time and the final time must be regarded as fixed. That is, you allow no variation of the path uh, or the velocity at those times. And so time essentially does come into the Lagrangian formalism, even though the idea of the formalism is that uh, one is, by a minimization process, choosing the entire path. Second question, what do clocks measure? And let me, uh, just to uh, give you a specific example, uh, mention the three clocks that are quite independently giving us the information that the universe is quite old uh, and, and comparably old. Uh, one of the great problems of cosmology that led to the general view that cosmology is a fairy tale uh, up until a little over 10 years ago was that it seemed that the oldest stars are something like 16 billion years old, whereas the universe appeared to be at most something like 10 billion years old according to the usual assumptions. Uh, that got fixed by uh, a recalibration of the distance scale and thereby the brightness of the uh, apparently older stars, and it turned out they were younger. So now we have three different clocks. One is stellar evolution, 
Another is radioactive decay, because it turns out to be possible to date these old stars in a completely different way using uranium and thorium. And third, the expansion of the universe. And uh, the most precise is this 13.7 billion year old history from the expansion of the universe, but it's quite consistent now with the other two clocks. So what is it that clocks measure, and in particular those clocks, if not time? Uh, and isn't it significant that completely different clocks seem to measure the same time? Mm. Then next, uh, as we now know, uh, the fundamental forces are not time independent. In particular, the discovery of CP violation means that there's an arrow of time coming from the fundamental forces. Isn't that significant and doesn't that tell us something about time? Then finally, Mach's program, it seems to me, was significantly undermined when it turned out not to be possible, despite Einstein's greatest hopes, to realize Mach's conjecture within the framework of general relativity. That is to explain the origin of inertia as being due merely to uh, a uh, discordance between local motion and the large-scale universe. Uh, doesn't that undermine the whole Machian program? So I'm sorry that there are four separate questions, but it seems to me that uh, anyone who puts forward a conjecture like yours has to deal at least with these questions. Could you just remind me what number three was? Number three, the uh, arrow of time. Oh, yeah, the CPT. CPT. Which is essential to understand the origin of the matter antimatter asymmetry, which okay, leads yes. to our own existence, as Sakharov was um, the first to point out. Long thing. The first one I can, I can uh, dispose of quite easily. There is a, a more fundamental, in fact, actually, the, um, the first formulation of the principle of least action did not involve time at all. It's Jacobi's principle. And it was actually the principle that um, Euler and Lagrange were using. You don't actually fix a time difference between uh, the things. Uh, it's, it's what gives you the orbits in configuration space of the system. It's what gives you the planetary orbits. When you solve the uh, Kepler problem and get the elliptical orbit and then use energy or angular momentum conservation but to find the, the speed in orbit. But it's not the most general formulation. Certainly you can deal with individual trajectories that are not. Ah, but you're, you're, you're assuming that. It's only for periodic cases but, that you can use you, the you, equation. Hmm? It's only for periodic uh, situations where you can use the, the, the Jacobi formula. No, no, Jacobi is absolutely general, completely general. It, it works for, it works for, a, a, it's, it's for a fixed energy in Newtonian theory. There's a different value for a different energy. But as Poincaré pointed out, we're, we're in one universe, if it's a classical universe, and it's only got one energy. We don't know whether, this is the problem of the, that's one way of looking at the cosmological constant. It's like the total energy in a Newtonian system. Uh, we don't know whether it's a universal constant or something to do with initial conditions. So that problem is, is real. but I, let me say one other thing here, which is, I think, very, very mysterious. In fact, if these ideas of that only angles count, it's not possible totally to get rid of, of, of distance, but it happens in a very mysterious way, and it's exactly right at the heart of cosmology, is that there's no meaning of saying that the universe has a size at an instant, but it seems to be impossible to explain the facts of cosmology without assuming that the universe has got larger in the classical approximation. And that's in the first approximation is exactly reflected in the redshift, which is a dimensionless number. So the variational principle that m my collaborators and I are working on um, involves actually not time. Now, there's a time difference in the Newtonian variational principle, but it's actually a ratio of either the volume of the universe at two times, which is a dimensionless quantity, or the ratio of what's called the York time, which is the, the, the rate at which t space is I expanding. And this seems to me very mysterious and very interesting. I was on a radio program with Martin Rees, and he, he rebuked me for saying that the, the, big, the big Bang stinks in the expanding universe. And uh, I've, I've, I'm a bit more uh, careful now, Martin. I don't think you can explain, at the moment, I really don't think you can explain the facts of cosmology without allowing for some expansion. Thing. I still find it very mysterious, but when you actually go down to the fundamental way of describing these things dynamically, you're replacing a time difference by a ratio, but it's a ratio either, you can either think of it as a volume or it's canonical conjugate, which is the York time. So that's a very mysterious and very profound thing, I think, and it, it may undermine these ideas to do with the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Um, 
CPT, I'm not an expert on that. The second uh, question had to do with clocks. What is it that clocks measure? And I mentioned three clocks in particular, stellar evolution, radioactive decay, and the expansion of the universe. You haven't dealt with, you mentioned the expansion. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, no, I was still but answering. What about the other two and the fact that they seem to be telling us the same thing? Sorry. <laughs> well, first of all, <laughs> it's the incomprehensibility alarm. Yes. Uh, now, all of those are not actually clocks like, like my watch on my, my arm. They are records embedded in, in some sort of way. And I would answer it with Hippolyta. They all agree. This is, I mean, she says it's... It's very strange and admirable, which means wonderful, that everything coheres together. This is an incredible fact about the universe. This is what I was saying. Now, my conjecture is, and as I say, it's a very wild conjecture, is that this is somehow to do with the integrity of the configuration space, that every possible configuration of the universe exists because it has the same common structure, and that somehow or other when you apply something like the time-independent Schrodinger equation to that, you will just get a coherent story out of it. Now, I, I don't I take any offense if you raise your eyebrows. <laughs> uh, that's it there. That's the best I can do. Um, I, I, over lunch, we can talk about the three-body problem where I can perhaps begin to make some justification for these claims. Uh, as regards CPT, as the, the, the time invariance thing. I'm not an expert on that, and I don't want to stick my neck out on it. I did, Don Page said I needn't worry about it because I really should take into account the full CPT. CPT is still a conserved thing. And if I look at it properly, Don assured me I'd be all right. I've never got round to really looking this in detail, so I apologize what for that. CPT tells you is that if there is CP violation, there must also be T violation, which means that there's an arrow of time. And that's what's required, according to Sakharov's argument, along with two other requirements. We only have about 15 minutes, yeah, yeah, sorry. but that was super. Yeah. Um, George Ellis, please. Yeah. Um, I have two questions for Julian. The first one is, you haven't, you, you talked about these time capsules and you used various examples. You said the brain with memories we can access. How does the brain access these capsules? What is your view of the brain? I, I'm not a cognitive science. No, I'm not asking you a cognitive science. The question is, is the brain based in physics or is it not based in physics? Oh, I'm a realist. It is based on physics. Okay, there, is is a, there is a physical counterpart of my memories and my feeling that I have a past. I, I, I believe in psychophysical parallelism as formulated by von Neumann in quantum mechanics, in his book on quantum mechanics. So I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not aware of... I, what, what I'm trying to get at is... Does your assumption about the wave function of the universe, does it apply to the brain or does it not apply to the brain? It, 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 it gives a, a certain structure to my brain. But it is that a static structure? structure? My brain, yes. It, if, if I could freeze my brain in an instant and put it in aspic, there would be all of my memories encoded there. So, so, so the brain is static, or the probabilities of what the brain will do are static. So therefore, how can the brain read anything? How I, I take refuge, and I am quite prepared to admit it, I take refuge in consciousness. We do not know how we come to be aware of anything. Okay, in other words, you're abandoning neuroscience. You believe that the mind and the brain are disjoint from each other. Not, no, by no means. If I think it's entirely possible that when I move my hand like that... In you can't move your hand because everything is static. <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> uh, Bernard Carr. Sorry, sorry, I had a second question. I'm sorry. Um, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, what is your warrant for believing that the Wheeler-DeWitt equation applies to the universe as a whole, given inter alia the fact that both Wheeler and DeWitt disowned the Wheeler-DeWitt equation in the later parts of their lives? Uh, first uh, answer is it's, it's, it's very difficult not to take it seriously. If you, It's the Hamilton-Jacobi equation essentially made, made quantum. As regards what DeWitt said about it, 
I once talked to Piles about the Wheeler DeWitt equation. I explained it to him. Piles said, so much the worse for the Wheeler DeWitt equation, it's wrong. A couple of months later, I met Bryce DeWitt, and I thought I'll tell him this story okay. about what Piles had said. And to my surprise, Bryce immediately started defending his equation rather vigorously. Yeah. But, but, but <laughs> and that was towards the end of his life, too. Sure. But c can you give some way of testing whether the Wheeler DeWitt equation does apply to the universe as a whole? Uh, uh, this is totally. Quantum mechanics applies on the microscopic scale. You're assuming it applies to the entire universe. This is an extrapolation of many hundreds of orders of magnitude. What is your warrant for extrapolating from the microscopic scale to the universe as a whole? I think there are some very wonderful properties in quantum mechanics to the extent I understand it. I think it does in many ways make a lot of sense, particularly in this exploring of possibility spaces. So how can you test whether this is a correct extrapolation or not? When Riemann put forward his idea of curved spaces and things, there was no way of testing it at that stage. Look what came 50, 60 years later with Einstein's general theory of relativity, and we're still exploring all the consequences now, George. Bernard Carr? Um, ye yes, I'd, I'd like to express a view which is um, uh, rather heretical, and I know it would certainly get me into trouble with uh, physicists, and I'm sure it'll also get into trouble with the philosophers, but um, it is simply this, that uh, when one is addressing the problem of, of experience of time, of, of the passing of time, as they refer to it, it seems to me that that problem, um, that process cannot even be described in a normal four-dimensional terms. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me at all, Julian, that in your analysis you find there's no evidence for time. I mean, when you say there's no time and then you crack jokes about, you know, we've got to get break for lunch and things like that, that's basically an inconsistency be between physical time and experiential, if you like, mental time. And my own perspective is simply that mental time, passing time, is simply outside the four-dimensional description altogether. And I'm sure that so long as your, and your analysis was entirely in terms, of course, of a four-dimensional picture. And, and so I'm not at all surprised that when you conduct such an analysis, you conclude that time is an illusion. I mean, it seems to me that the, um, a really interesting concept in terms of the passage of time is the concept of specious present, which is the sort of minimum time you can experience. And uh, I always have this simple picture of a light going around, and the light goes round, and, and you're, you have the passing of time as the light goes round. We know if the light goes round too fast, you don't see it at all. You can't resolve it, and so you just see one continuous line. Time has disappeared. If you make the light go round too slowly, you don't see it either, because we die before it moves a perceptible amount. So the experience of time is only exists over... A, a relatively narrow range of time scales. Um, and that experience, it seems to me, uh, and that is why most of the time you're talking about things which are outside. When you talk about quantum mechanics, you're normally talking about things which are outside the domain of experience. When you're talking about cosmological processes, you're normally talking about things which are outside those range of human experience time scales. So the point I'd like to make is that um, I, I just don't think that if you want to have any reference to mentality, essentially, that you can do it in a simple four-dimensional picture. And the picture I myself advocate, even though it's very unpopular, um, it's a picture which I think used to be of interest to philosophers at one stage, is that actually um, you need somehow some extra dimension to try and get this flow of time. I mean, C.D. Broad sort of pushed this view. And, and I have my own rather unconventional approach, which associates that extra dimension with the sort of extra dimensions which are brain, arise in you know, brain cosmology, uh, B-R-A-N-E, brain cosmology. But that's very unconventional, and probably no one believes it. But the main point I want to make is that I simply don't think you can address the question of what is time, what is the passing of time, in a four-dimensional perspective. Mm. Uh, with, with Dirac, I would say that was not a question, but a comment. Uh, but uh, fair enough. Actually, could I just, though, correct? Uh, I don't think in terms of, of a four-dimensional space-time. I think in terms of a multidimensional, infinite-dimensional configuration space. That's just a correction. But um, these are so mysterious. And, and I mean, I, uh, I'm very sensitive to the sort of critique that George makes. Uh, I mean, I am sticking my neck out. Uh, so I, I'm 
totally prepared to accept that I might be way off and that there is much to learn and very mysterious things that we haven't got into at all. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in this at all decrying the, the really fascinating things that people have talked about, like David talked about and, and LA, LA talked about and then neuroscience. I mean, that's all fascinating itself. I'm just saying it doesn't address the fundamental issue of where the passage of time comes from. Mm. I think uh, Flatland is, is, uh, explores that idea. Um, let's see. For the last question for the session, I think there was a, a woman that wanted to speak. Um, is perhaps indicating that. Anybody? Am I wrong? Was it an intuition? <laughs> the space is open. Okay. The moving hand writes. Uh, I'm reminded of um, when I spent my junior year abroad at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I was a religious foyer and I would go to every manner of religious services, uh, Jewish, Muslim, all manner of Christian services. and. It was really wonderful because I didn't know what they were saying. They were all speaking a foreign language, but I got the ethos and the pathos, but none of the logos. And so I, I've felt that way um, in different parts of the uh, discussion. But I'm intrigued um, by what the logos might mean here. And um, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm reminded, of course, that um, in many religious mystical traditions, there's this idea that you achieve some state of consciousness uh, where you r attain non-duality or um, uh, De Quilly and Newberg call it absolute unitary being, a sense of transcendence. Of course, we could study that uh, with uh, cognitive neuroscience sciences and s stick the people under uh, PET scans and fMRIs and try to figure out what's going on in their brain. And that's something we might do with some of the physicists here as well. Um, I'm not sure where it would get us, but Joel, are you um, willing um, to um, be a subject? I don't know. But, but it, it is, is, is that experience that um, um, some of our fellow humans claim to have um, in very powerful ways, is that a, a data reference that, um, for the physicists in any way in thinking about time? So it's, um, it's a curious question, and I'm, I'm just reminded in closing that there's a lovely line from Whitehead, which I'll probably mangle, but um, who knew something of the physics and the mathematics, but he says that all, all past actualities and all future possibilities intersect in this moment, and that's the meaning of eternity. So, um, but now lunch is waiting, so we don't want to stay here too long in this moment of eternity. But anyway, I'm just curious what anybody would like to comment, whether there's, whether the phenomenology of uh, mystical experiences uh, it has any relevance at all to uh, these discussions. And, and, and whether, you know, some of the physicists might have these experiences, for all I know, when they're immersed in their, in their work. Um, just, and this is, I guess, a response both to this and to the previous comment. Um, let me focus on the previous comment first. Um, unlike Julian, um, there was very much of an attempt being outlined in my talk to understand these phenomena of passage within, um, within this block four-dimensional context. What would be of interest to a project like that, I think, is not just to hear um, someone say, I don't believe you can do that, but to say, here's what I think was wrong with the way, with, with the details of the way you tried to do it. That is, there was an attempt, or not, not an attempt presented, but an attempt sort of outlined or gestured toward in this talk to account for this phenomenology of the passage of time, precisely within this kind of uh, four dimensional block universe where talk about passage wasn't going to appear as something fundamental, but something somehow emergent or, or something like that. If, if, we're, if these different communities here are going to have an interesting dialogue about these sorts of things, it seems like the thing that would be fun to do would be to be able to say to each other more than, I believe X, I don't believe 
um, but to say, here's why I believe X, here's what I take the evidence to be for X, here's how I think you would go about constructing a picture of the world that's in accord with X, and have somebody else say, here's why I don't think it's gonna work, here's where I think you're making a mistake, um, something like that. Um, so it would be fun to get more comments like that. Um, Vis-a-vis the, the, the question of whether various particular human psychological states, um, like states of, of mystical enlightenment or something like that, um, um, are important data points here. Certainly there are lots of human psychological states that are important data points here. We have these impressions that by acting now we can affect the future, but not the past. We have a very different kind of epistemic access to the past than we do towards the future. If there are other, um, um, if there are other conditions of human phenomenological experience um, that are going to complicate these questions further, that's really interesting to know about. But it, but along those lines too, I would say, gee, tell me more about this. I I, I don't know off the cuff whether that's going to be an important data point uh, or not. Mm. Mind if I just add something? Yeah, so, well, which is just that um, the, and this is also in response to both of you, look, that's part of the issue with respect to the importance of temporal experience. And I guess I take the reductionist, someone, um, and each of you are a different kind of reductionist, as I understand what you want to say, to say, look, okay, maybe there's one project of trying to see whether or not we can construct a number of different instances of time. Okay, so I'm responding to Bernard first. Um, and then the question of if those are arranged in the right way, does that create the experience as a passage, which is what you were talking about? And my, th I guess my thought is you have, there are things you can say to try to address this concern that things that are experimentally, you know, very well documented. Um, and then once then, once and then, so you're, you're taking, the, you can take the four dimensionals kind of passage view very seriously. And also with, with, mis with respect to mystical experience as well, it's just a question of understanding um, exactly what the relationship is between the physical description and then the production of, of experience. And it's, I think a simple, a simple thought, well, look, I had this kind of experience, so therefore there must be something out in the world that somehow models that experience directly is too simple. All right. Uh, I, I and just would yes, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to to your point there, um, I do think that perhaps psychological experiences are uh, are giving insight. I'm very impressed with motion blindness; those people who experience the world as snapshots. And I have um, I conjecture that perhaps they are closer to reality than we are. Uh, that. And, and I've, I have been told that the people in meditation uh, get to a state where they, they also experience the world as snapshots. Um, so maybe, and, and given, because a snapshot is for me the, the sort of example of what a configuration is, an unchanging configuration. So maybe that, that is there. And just one other thing, uh, nearly two years ago I was very lucky to meet and be able to talk for about half an hour with Yakir Aharonov, with whom David did his, his, uh, his thesis, I think it was. Um, and I asked him whether he thought that through introspection one could get insights into the fundamental nature of quantum mechanics. And he said, absolutely, I've been thinking along those lines for decades. Um, I didn't, we didn't actually get down to what <laughs> insights he thought he was getting or I, because that was th the end of the, the thing. But um, there at least is one very significant scientist who, who was prepared to entertain that conjecture. We'll let uh, Bernard have the last word. I didn't want that, but uh, I mean, just to connect uh, what has been said to what the, the person after me remarked, um, the reason I think it's so crucial to emphasize specious present in, in analyzing experience is because specious present does vary. I mean, even for ordinary human beings, you know, with the neuroscientists experiment with their specious present changes. And there's the famous experiment with David Eagleman where he threw people off a tower and showed that they actually their time perception changed, their specious present changed. Oh, he had a net, by the way, at the bottom. But 
<laughs> but the point is that, as, as the previous gentleman said, that there are other experiences where the change in specious presence is, is even more dramatic. I mean, now, of course, those are mystical experiences which people might not take too seriously. But the point that I was trying to make was that we as human beings only perceive the world in a very narrow range of, t of, of time scales. And it's great hubris to assume that that's all that exists in the universe. Who is to say that there isn't some other level of consciousness in the universe which can experience things on a, on a different time scale? And all I'm saying is that if you want a picture of time, it better go beyond the bounds of a pure homo sapiens experience because in principle, one could perceive the world you know, on, on a different sort of range of time scales. That's what I'm saying. That's really actually very important. Um, I'd like to uh, mention that we'll gather again at 2.45, and uh, if, if, if you're one of the few, thank you very much, if you're one of the few who has not filled out this dumb form, please do. We need one from everybody so we can put you on the web. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, there will be a bus back to the hotels uh, at this point. Um, we will, uh, there will be another group photo at 6 o'clock for those of you who missed the the, the one uh, yesterday. We really want one, th one with Martin Reese in it. So, um, okay, so when we come back, we'll hear uh, uh, Bernard and uh, Tim Maudlin, uh, commented on by uh, Janet Martin Suskis and uh, Barry Lauer. Lower. Yeah. Thank you. Are we having lunch? Yeah, we what about lunch? Schedule. Schedule. There's confirmation. What about well, it's, you know, if somebody needs to go back and come back. Oh, okay. Oh, so there's lunch here, but you could go back yeah, if you want. But there is lunch here. here. Yes. James Lund just mentioned that, by the way, there's lunch here. There, there is lunch upstairs. Great. <laughs> yes, that'd be great. And Everybody what does this mean? Room. Sorry, disclosure form attached? Yes, uh, no? That's only if you have stuff that's copyrighted that you want.